Well, good to see you all this morning. If we get our piano player to the piano, we'll see what we can do about starting our service. And I uh, hope you had a wonderful week. Hope you're looking forward to a good revival this week. I hope you've prayed every day this week for Brother Monroe and, and all that goes on and that God will speak to, first speak to his heart and then speak to our hearts as he gives us what the Lord's given him. Looking forward to it. Let's stand together. We're going to sing a classic hymn. I think John Peterson wrote it. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. Now, enjoy and lift it up while you sing. Ready? Oh, what a wonderful, wonderful day. Day I will never forget. After I've wandered in darkness away, Jesus my Savior I met. Oh, what a tender compassion. A friend, he met the need of my heart. Shadows dispelling with joy, I am telling. He made all the darkness depart. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. When at the cross the Savior made me whole, my sins were washed away and my night was turned to day heaven came down and glory filled my soul born of the spirit with life from above into god's family divine justified fully through calvary's love oh what a standing is mine the transaction so quickly was made when as a sinner I came took the offer of grace he did proffer he saved me oh praise his dear name heaven came down and glory filled my soul when at the cross the Savior made me whole my sins were washed away, and my night was turned to day. Heaven came down, and glory filled my soul. Now I have a hope that will surely endure. Sing it. Now I have a hope that will surely endure. After the passing of time, I have a future in heaven for sure. Bearing those mansions of life, and it's because of that wonderful day when at the cross I believe. Rich is eternal and blessing supernal, his precious hand I receive. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. When at the cross the Savior made me whole my sins were washed away and my night was turned to day heaven came down and glory filled my soul heaven came down and glory This morning. Some of you are almost awake. Yeah. Almost. Let's sing. Here's one of the wake you up. Because he lives, think about it, I can face tomorrow. I couldn't face it without him, could you? So let's sing about it. God sent his son. God sent his son. They called him Jesus. He came to love.
chorus of the next verse. Which one do you want to go to? All right, let's do the chorus. <laughs> because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Be We're excited about being here. Are you excited this morning? Amen. Now we got to try one more time. Are you excited to be in church today? Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, we're excited to hear. Glad for what God has done. We're looking forward to what God's going to do. And we know that he is going to do something. And we've been praying for this. We're excited to have Brother Paul Monroe, his wife, here with us. Looking forward to what God wants to do. And we pray that you have prayed. And that you'll ask the Lord to work in your heart starting right now. So let's pray together. Ask the Lord to be with us today during our service. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for today. Thank you for a chance to be in your house. Lord, the opportunity to be able to say that it's because you live today. Lord, that's what separates what we believe from everything else. It's the fact that we know we have a risen Savior. And Lord, because of you today, you change lives. Lord, you mend the hurt and the pain. And God, you can make us into what you want us to be, and that's like your image. So help us today, Lord, to lift you up through this time. And we'll love you and praise you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated.
praise God that he is mine and I am his. We thank God that we have Christ in our hearts and our lives today. Well, give a quick report. We had a great time this past week. Those that were able to go uh, to the Pennsylvania trip, they were worried. Some of them were joking. It was like, uh, hey, man, you and Seth, y'all got beards. You look kind of ominous. You better be careful. They might kidnap you. I said, uh, they don't want me. They'd throw me back. They might keep Seth, but uh, they, don't, they don't want me. So, uh, but we had a great time, enjoyed ourselves. Apple cider donuts. I'll confess later. But it was, it was delicious. We had a fantastic time. How come every time you have a good trip, you talk about all the food you ate? It was, that's right, yeah, that was a good reason. But we, we had a fantastic time, so we thank God for the safety there and back and continue to pray. Again, uh, talking about what we've got coming up this week for our this revival that we're going to be doing right now, a couple of different things. Tonight is family night. I want to encourage you. Uh, I was telling my Sunday school class as we were making our way back from Pennsylvania yesterday, we were sending out messages to friends trying to invite them to come and be a part. Tonight is family night. I want to ask you, if you've not gone through, most of us have phones, right in the, the phone section, you can go to your contacts. I want to encourage you today to message someone, invite them, whether it's family, friends, whoever it may be, to come and be a part of our services tonight and then also on Monday night and Tuesday night. So tonight is family night and then Tuesday is HCA night, but then tomorrow night, I thought this was pretty interesting. This was a preacher's idea. He said it's called favor day. I said, well, what does that mean? Preacher says, simple. You just walk up to somebody and say, hey, uh, you, you do me a favor? And they go, yeah, I'll do you a favor. All right, then you come to church tomorrow night. That's what we need to do. So favor day is you got to ask somebody for a favor, and the favor is come and be a part of church, okay? So I want you to encourage throughout the next couple of days to invite and encourage people to come and be a part. I believe God's going to do something through our revival. How many of you believe God's going to do something through this revival that we're doing? Amen. If that's true, we need to do our part and try to encourage people to be a part of what we're doing. Several different things that we have going on. Missions renewal to be on the 27th. We do have election day coming up on the 5th. And so make certain that you're praying for that and that we're preparing and go out and vote as well. So that way we make sure we're a part of those things. Baby dedication on November 10th. A lot of different announcements that are coming up. If you didn't get all of those, make sure you grab a bulletin. Do want to make one quick one on the 30th. That's October 30th. We're going to be doing something for the Shine Kids called Glowing in the Darkness. We don't want to celebrate horror and all the other scary things. We want to celebrate Jesus Christ, and so this is an opportunity for us to do that. And so please mention, if you will, to kids on the 30th at 7 o'clock, we're going to be having that. We'll have booths and different things for the kids to do, and so make sure that they're coming to be a part of that. One more last announcement that we have. You'll see chickens everywhere. I think they're just trying to make us hungry. No. The 26th, next Saturday, we're going to be having an event that's sponsored by our Booster Club and the school, okay? So through the school, through our Booster Club, to be able to raise some support for our, our teams, uh, we're going to be having that next Saturday. And so if you have questions about that, see us. But it will be next Saturday uh, on the 26th. Go ahead and plan to come and get some chicken. We've got tons of different things we'll have, so we look forward to that. So make sure you're there for that. All right, at this time, we'll have our ushers come forward to take our Sunday morning offering. Praise God for the chance to give back to him. God is a blessing to us. The Bible says that he loads us with his benefits each and every day. And so we're thankful to be able to give back to him. Let's pray together. Dear God, thank you for who you are in our lives. Thank you for what you've done. Help us to be able to do back and give back to you. We love you and we praise you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
I'd like to add one thing about this election that you need to go out and vote like your vote's going to make the difference. I, uh, quick history lesson, 1960, when John F. Kennedy beat Richard Nixon for president, he won the election by 100,000 votes. Now, there are 100,000 precincts in this country. Had one person in each precinct voted differently, Richard Nixon would have been the president, John F. Kennedy wouldn't. Perhaps he never would have been shot. Perhaps there would never have been a Watergate. That's what one vote can do. So don't think my vote's not important. You get out there and vote like your vote's going to make the difference in the election. No charge for that public announcement. Now, let's stand one more time. Here's one of my favorites again. You're doing good songs today. It is well with my soul. We'll split it up on the chorus. And choir, you help us. We'll do some different parts. You know what we're doing. Here we go. When peace like the Sing it out now. And come back. It is well with my soul. With my soul. Everyone. Well, it is well with my soul. Oh, say. Sing it together. Ready?
could make my wrongs right than that old accuser to the Lord did cry. He is a sinner, and now he must die. Then I heard a voice saying, Father, of the cross to save that child who is sick, sick and lost and is still the blood that saves from sin is still the blood that cleanses within from the highest star in heaven to the depths of that brings victory to me. There are those who rely on the works that they do, and some men count on the times they break through. But when the battle's over and my last song is sung, I'll hold Father's precious Son, and it's still the blood that saves from sin. It's still the blood that cleanses within, from the highest star in heaven to the depths of the sea. It is still the blood of Jesus that brings victory to me and it's still the blood that saves from sin it's still the blood that cleanses within from the highest star in heaven to the depths of the sea it's still the blood of jesus that brings victory to me. It is still the blood of Jesus that brings victory to me. Amen. Well, that's amazing that they could sing after all they've eaten in the last few days. <laughs> He just didn't eat donuts, I promise you. <laughs> the uh, blessings through the years have been more than I could count or write about. And uh, you've heard many of the stories through the years, but none, none greater than the fact that God brought Brother Paul in, into our lives and our church family. And uh, I guess... You're not the only two left that preached in the storefront building out of the folks we had there. And that's because we were just children then, but you can tell now we're a little bit older and a little more feeble, but we're preaching the same book about the same blood. Amen. And I'm glad he's here. We're not quite finished with our celebration this, this 50th year, but uh, we're saving the best to last, Brother Paul. You come and preach what God gives you. Amen. Uh, thank you for being here. Thank you, preacher. Well, it's good to be here. Good to see you again. Uh, every time I come here, I think I'm home. I've been here so many times, but I see some new faces, and that's always good to see new faces. And I, I just don't say this because I'm here today, but you, if you know anything about me, and some of you have known me for a long time, I just praise the Lord for this church all the time. And one of the reasons I do is because your preacher has stayed faithful Amen. all these years to preach God's Word. That's right. He cares about souls, and he's a soul winner. 
and he has made that, put that at the top burner of the church, and that's the way it should be. And so I'm thankful that uh, I can be here again for a couple of days with you. And I'm going to ask you to take your Bibles, and we're going to look this morning. I normally take a passage and just go through it, but I'm going to do something just a little bit different today. I want you to turn to the Psalms, and I want you to turn to Psalm 85, and then I want you to turn to the book of Habakkuk. I'll give you a little time on that one. Habakkuk chapter 3. I'm going to look at two verses, one in Psalms. You're familiar with the 85th Psalm. It's a psalm that we often use, and you hear preachers preach on the subject of revival. And then, of course, you've probably heard sermons from Habakkuk chapter 3, uh, the verse that we'll read this morning. Now, I want you to look with me, first of all, Psalm 85, and this will be a very familiar verse, but I want you to look at it carefully with me. Because there's two questions that I think we need to ask today in our churches and God's people as much as anything I know. The first question is this. Do we need revival? Would y'all answer my question? Amen. Yes, we do. Never, ever have we needed revival in our churches and in our lives more than we do today. The question, the second question I want to ask you, and this is primarily what I'm going to talk about this morning, is do you want revival? Amen. Do you really want revival? Now look at Psalm chapter 85, familiar verse, look at verse 6. It says, Will thou not revive us again, that thy people may rejoice in thee? I, I read that verse of scripture, and I want you to notice just one word. It is again. Wilt thou not revive us again, that thy people may rejoice in thee? And then I want you to look at the verse in Habakkuk chapter 3, and look, if you will, at verse 2. Verse 2. O Lord, I have heard thy speech and was afraid. O Lord, revive thy work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make known in wrath, remember mercy. Just a little background about that particular verse. Habakkuk was troubled by the ungodly life of the nation of Judah. And he is troubled enough to plead with God to give revival. Her kings had led Judah in a downward spiral. And as a result of that, that downward spiral caused God's people at that time to become complacent and indifferent and cold toward the things of God. We have a nation that in many cases is just like the nation that Habakkuk was talking about. We've already heard about the importance of voting. Uh, this next election. Brother Tim talked in our class this morning that this is, I believe it is, the single most important election yeah. that we've had in our country. Right. And if Christians don't vote, we're in a lot of trouble. Right. And so I won't preach a political message right now, but believe me, I could, but I won't. But I can say this. The church does need revival. We need revival desperately. When I talk about revival, I'm talking about people that know the Lord. We often, the, the text in Psalm said we need revival, revive us what again? Because revival doesn't last forever. Unbelievers need evangelism. Saints of God need revival. I, I think about Billy Sunday said something that just, really got a hold of my heart when I was studying and preparing this message. He said a critic come up to him one day and said, uh, uh, you know, revivals doesn't work. We have them all the time. And Billy Sunday said, well, getting a bath doesn't work either all the time. That's why we need revived again and again and again, beginning individually, corporately in the church, and prayerfully nationally 
in our country. I, I love to study the history of revivals, and I, I'll just give you a couple things for you to think about as we talk about revival this morning and do we really want it. In uh, 1904, there was a revival that began across the ocean in, in Wales. It's called the Welsh Revival. Evan Roberts was a young man who had prayed for 11 years that God would send revival to his country. And as a result of his prayers and some of his friends meeting on daily prayer meeting bases, after that, hundreds and thousands of souls were saved in Wales. You go to Wales today, and the churches, many of the churches that were filled with people who were saved in those meetings, and a spirit revival swept that country, are now mosques, their gambling places, their bars, the list goes on and on and on. Why? Because revival doesn't last long unless we get serious about it in our hearts and lives. Right. Then I think about the revival in 1932 in North China where one little lady prayed and asked God to send revival. And as a result of that, in the town that she was in, over 10,000 people come to know Christ as their Lord and Savior. Today you go to China, and if you're a Bible-preaching church like this church, you will not do it publicly and preach like your preacher preaches and not suffer consequences as a result of it. In 1936, a, a Bible college at that time, it was called Wheaton College. And in that college, there began a prayer meeting back in 1936. And there were students getting on their knees and praying and asking God to forgive them of their pride and their criticism and all the things that were hindering them from being what God wanted them to be. And as a result of that prayer meeting, back in 1936, there were hundreds of missionaries and preachers who were called to serve the Lord full-time all the way all through and all around the world. Today, he, Wheaton College is woke. You know what I mean by that, don't you? Everything has changed. And the thing that made the school what it was is no longer the truth. One of my favorite uh, authors that I love to read, who's been with the Lord now some time, is a man named Leonard Ravenhill. He was a revivalist. And listen to what he said. He says, as long as we are content to live without revival, we will. Yep. As long as we're content to live without revival, we will. Now, I believe that there are some characteristics that must take place if we really want revival. And I want to give you those things right quickly. And you could take the word revival, and we could use it as a little acrostic to tell you what is important and why we need revival. First of all, if we're going to have revival, we've got to repent. That's right. I mean, we have got to repent of our sins. Now, I, you know, I can stand up here and rightfully so preach a lot about the issues of our day. But I want to talk about us who are God's people for a few minutes. It's so easy to get complacent. But we don't think complacency is as much a sin as getting drunk. Yep. But it is. That's right. And all I'm saying is this. If we want God to give us revival, we, gotta, we must look deeply in our hearts and in our lives and pray with the psalmist, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Amen. And see if there be any wicked way in me. And if it's there, repent of it. That's right. And repent of it. Then, then and now, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians, for godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. We have a tendency to skip over anything that's not on our agenda that they are doing, and we don't look in our own hearts, and it keeps us from having revival. The psalmist said, that we should not stand in the way of sinners. Yep. We should be clean and pure and honest before the Lord our God. The second thing is we need to exalt Christ. We need to exalt Christ. 
A revived heart has an overwhelming desire to lift Jesus up. Not men, not programs, but Jesus Christ Amen. and him crucified. We need to learn to lift him up. You, you see, we can do a, a lot of good things in our churches, and we do. We ought to have good music. We ought to have good preaching. We ought to have good activity and all the things that you do in this church. But can I tell you this? If any of that does not exalt him, then you miss the boat. That's right. That's right. If the choir, as they sang so beautifully this morning, if the music that they sang and it did doesn't exalt the Lord, then it was just music. That's right. Just music. And folks, if we're going to have revival, he must be the centerpiece. Amen. He must be the hero. I like what Isaiah said, and you're familiar with it. He said, in the year the king Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up. Oh, that that would be our desire, that he would be high and lifted up. When real revival comes, we'll not be talking about the revival. We'll be talking about Jesus. We'll be talking about Jesus and lifting him up in our hearts and lives. Paul said that Christ in Colossians is our life. And corporately, we need to exalt him. Then there's another thing that we need to do, and that is we need to value Christ. You say, what do you mean by that? We show what we value by what we seek as our priorities. Right. I hope you heard that. We seek what we value by looking at what our priorities are. A good sign of revived hearts is when we value Christ and seek him. We have the passion that he has. We have the mission that he has. We seek after souls for his kingdom personally and regularly, telling people about Jesus. Did not our Lord said that our job is to seek and to save that which was lost? Yes. I mean, that's not just black ink on white paper. That's what God said that we need to be doing. And then there's another thing, and that is we must learn to intercede if we're going to have revival. I've never heard or read about a revival that was not preceded by intercessory prayer. That's right. Not one. All the revivals in the Bible were preceded by prayer. All the revivals in church history were preceded in prayer. When the day of Pentecost come, it was preceded by prayer. Prayer. Somebody said this, and I probably said it in this church. The early church prayed and fasted. The modern church prays fast. Yep. And that's why we do not have revival. That's why often we don't even want revival because it would mess up our schedules. There's another thing that I want you to see, when we have revival, then we'll volunteer to serve the Lord. We'll volunteer to serve the Lord. I love that. You remember I read Isaiah chapter 6, when the Lord was lifted up? Think about that passage. You've heard it preached before. But in verse 5, it says, Woe is me. So what was Isaiah doing? He was responding in repentance. Woe is me. In verse 6, he was purified with a coal from off of the altar of God. And then in verse 8, he volunteered to serve the Lord because of what God did in his heart. He said, here am I, Lord, send me. Amen. Now, I tell you what's easier to do than that is here am I, send David Dupree. Yeah. Here am I, send somebody else. Moses, here am I, Lord. I want to serve you, but you use Aaron. Can I tell you this morning, if you've been saved by the grace of God, God wants to use you. Amen. He wants to revive you individually if you'll come and trust him and walk with him as you should. I think our churches today, in light of the, the, the circumstances that we're living in now in our nation, I think our churches today ought to have people jumping up and down to serve the Lord. That's right. I don't think we ought to have to beg people. 
to go visit him. I don't think we ought to beg people to sing in the choir. I don't think we need to beg people, just be here when the door's open unless providentially entered. We ought to want to be here. This is God's church. Amen. And we're here to lift him up. Well, if we're not here, we're not lifting him up. That's why we desperately need, re need revival again. And then there's another thing, and that is when we do all those things that I've mentioned, then there'll be evangelism. Always get to that. Something's got to work before we really get a passion for souls and see people come to know the Lord. True revival gives a renewed emphasis upon us spreading the word of God. People are lost everywhere. They're lost here. They're lost everywhere I go. They're lost where I live. I live in a, in a neighborhood, and on one side of me is a guy that I've witnessed to over and over again. And he'll look you in the eye and he'll say, I have no interest in what you have to say. On this side over here is a guy that is a foreigner. He's from somewhere in Asia. He doesn't speak real good English. I, I, I got a track of his language and I showed him an app on his phone where he could hear the gospel in his own tongue. In his own tongue. And he stands there and looks at me like, I have a religion. I said, you do, but you don't have Jesus. Right. And it doesn't matter what your religion is if you don't have Jesus. They're everywhere. You, we can talk to people. I, I wear a question mark on all my suits and uh, shirts, and people all, all the time walk up to me. Are you dumb? Do you have a question mark on your, on your coat? I've got a question mark there for a reason. Because I want the opportunity to talk to people. And when they ask me, what's that question mark for? Then I say, has anybody told you today that Jesus loves you? Yep. That opens up a wonderful opportunity to be able to share the gospel, to pray with people, to encourage people who are discouraged. So the question, again, I come back to is we, do we really want revival? Do we desire revival? I was telling you that Leonard Ravenhill was one of my favorite authors when it comes to revival. If you've never read his book, Why Revival Tarries, you ought to read it ten times because it'll stir your soul. Listen to a couple of things that Ravenhill said. He said, a man who is intimate with God will not be intimidated by men. Yeah. I want you to hear that. That's why we need to be bold and strong and stand up for Jesus. He said, a man may study because his brain is hungry for knowledge, even Bible knowledge, but he prays because his soul is hungry for God. Although we get hungry for God again in our lives. The early church was married to poverty, prisons, and persecutions. Today the church is married to prosperity. Yep. And because of that, we're not seeing God send revival. If we had more sleepless nights, Raven Hill said in prayer, we'd have fewer souls having sleepless night, a sleepless night in hell. At this grim hour, the world sleeps in darkness and the church sleeps in light. If we will do God's work, God's way, and God's time, and God's power, we can have God's blessing. I've been here a lot of times to preach to you. Years ago, and I think it was over, I'm not sure, this auditorium. It was in the, I don't think it was down on the corner. I think it was in this, I, I never will forget one night I was, we was having a revival. And the choir sang. I don't know if y'all sang this song lately or not, but I've never gotten over it. If anybody else didn't have revival that night, I did. And I want to go back and read you the words to, the, to what the choir sang. It was written by a lady. Her name is Ruth Green. She's from Greenville, South Carolina. No relation to Oliver, Oliver Green, but her Miss 
Miss Green wrote this song out of a burden for her church to have revival. And your choir sang it. Listen to the words. Do you really want revival? Do you really want God's power? Do you really want his spirit to control your life this hour? Oh, repent and turn to Jesus. Seek his face and humbly pray. Do you really want revival? Are you willing to obey? Are you praying for revival? Are you praying for God's power? Are you praying for his spirit to control your life this hour? Oh, the Lord is ever faithful. He will hear us when we pray. Are you praying for revival? Are you willing to obey? Yes, I really want revival. Yes, I really want God's power. And I really want his spirit to control my life this hour. Oh, I'm looking now to Jesus. I will seek his face and pray. For I really want revival. I'm willing to obey. What a song. Amen. What words. I started out by asking you two questions. The second one was this. Do you really want revival? I know where I'm at. I know who I'm preaching to as far as the church and your stand for the truth. But it's easy to get used to just doing the same thing all the time. Right. Having the same Thing that we do and it's like the lady said we've always done it that way and we're not going to change a thing you don't change biblical principles and truth I'm not talking about that but wonder what would happen wonder what would happen if, a God, if God would put a shout in your soul again yes. wonder what would happen I'll tell you this story and then I'll close Years ago, the first church I started, and I, I, I've been preached here so many times, I probably have used all these illustrations. David's got them written down in his Bible. But anyway, I started a church in a little place just 22 miles down the road from Winston-Salem, Tyro, North Carolina. By then, all it had was a service station, a pool hall, and a Smith's merchandise store. That was it. That was Tyro. It was very rural, needed to stay. When you did door-to-door -door visitation, you did it a mile at a time. And we started Grace Baptist Church. We were in a pool hall. And it was an old building. And uh, we had rented it. It's the only place I could find to, to rent something. So people had pu punched their holes in the ceiling with their cue sticks so much it went to rain I felt like I was a Methodist. I was getting sprinkled on. <laughs> but anyway, God began to work. And people were getting saved. I mean this literally, left and right. And people in our little church started praying for the loved ones. And we had this one little lady in our church. And she was such a sweet little lady, but you, you, when you talk with her, she was very intimidated. She said, Preacher... I can't read very well. I said, no, maybe you can't read very well, but you can pray for your son. And she said, well, you join me and let's pray for Larry. I said, well, I'll do it. And so we started praying for Larry. One Sunday morning, Larry come to church. He sat on the back row, and I preached. And I got ready to give the invitation. I had everybody's heads bowed and their eyes closed. And I said, if you're not sure you're going to heaven when you die, could I pray for you? Larry raised his hand. We started singing the invitation. Everybody's head was bowed. And we sang with our heads bowed and our eyes closed because I didn't want anybody to be intimidated. I wanted him to feel free if the, if the Spirit of God was leading him. And down the aisle, Larry comes. He took my hand and he said, Preacher, I want to get saved. I know I've been mean as a devil. I know I've broken my mama's heart. But I want to get saved. Now you Baptists, hold on a minute. His mama looked up. And there was Larry. I said, everybody look up here a minute. I said, this is Larry. 
And his mom has prayed and prayed and prayed that he get saved. And all of a sudden, she started shouting all over that church. I mean, she was, it was real. It wasn't put on. It was the real deal. And her heart was just absolutely thrilled over her son coming to know the Lord as her Savior. You know what happened? When he got saved, a bunch of other people started getting saved because of prayer and the power of prayer. And people for a time wanted God to send revival to their church. Don't you want to see people come down these aisles and trust Christ as their Savior? Let me tell you, it all depends on God and it depends on you. Do you really, really, really want revival? Bow your heads, please, for prayer. Do we really want revival? In a moment, Brother Tim's going to lead us in a hymn of invitation. Some are already coming. I pray that more will. You say, Preacher, I'm, I'm getting old. I can't do a lot anymore. You can pray. You can ask, your God, ask God to break your heart again for souls. You can be a witness wherever you are. Age is not the problem, folks. It's our commitment to the Lord and what he wants us to do. In a minute, I'm going to ask you to stand and invite you to come and kneel at this altar if you're physically able and ask God, beg God to use you to bring revival to this church. Before I do, though, I want to ask maybe two or three or four or five or six or more that may not know for sure that Christ is their Savior. You're not sure if you were to die today, you'd go to heaven. How many times have you heard that? And yet the reality is we're all one heartbeat away from eternity. And what we've done with Jesus Christ is all that matters. You say, well, preacher, I've been a pretty bad person. Or someone would say, well, I don't think I'm that bad, but I'm not sure I'm saved. This is God's grand opportunity in your life for you to, you to make things right with the Lord right now. Nobody's going to embarrass you. Nobody's going to come and drag you out of your seat. We don't do that here. But I'd love to pray for you, and I promise you I won't embarrass you, but I'd like to pray for you. You say, preacher, I'm not 100% sure if I were to die. I'd go to heaven. If Jesus were to come, I'm not sure I'd be ready to go. Would you pray for me? Would you just put your hand up and put it right back down? I'll pray for you. I promise you I will. I'm not sure I'm saved. I want to know for sure that I am. All right? Would you stand, please, with your heads bowed, your eyes closed? You'll know this song. And while we sing it, search me, O God, know my heart. Christian, will you come? Will you come, brother, sister, whoever you are, and say, Lord, I want revival. I want to start right now in my heart. While we sing, you come, will you, right now? Search me, O oh God. Um 
time do we have? Well, well it's going to be busy at the claims. We better hurry up. Jesus is coming. You know he's coming. If we don't have revival, we'd have wished we'd have prayed a lot harder. And I appreciate you being here, and I appreciate Brother Paul and the message. And, you know, we, we can put on our little fronts, but I've heard your prayer requests. I visited in your homes. I know who you are. I know what you're going through. Not all of it. I know a lot of it because you shared it with me. And we can just sit back like in our piety, everything's wonderful. Folks, it's not going to get any better if we don't humble ourselves before That's God. That's right. And just, just absolutely be honest with God, get right with God. Stop kidding yourself. I don't want to be miserable. I want to be happy. The happiest you'll ever be is when you know that you're saved and you know that you're right with God. Amen. Good, simple Bible preaching. Thank God. Now, I'm not fussing at you. Not at all. I'm just trying to encourage you. Let's, let's just get it right. Let's, let's just let God have his way. Thank you for being here. Be back tonight. Some of you are determined. Now, preacher, I can't come back tonight. I, you can do what you choose to do. And I'm praying God will help you choose to be here, bring somebody with you, family. Families are a mess. I, I, don't, I don't want to keep you. But I figured up this week. And this is in the middle of the night, Lord, touched my heart. We have 14 families of our church that have people in their families living together without being married. All of them but four have children. There's no excuse for it. I'm not making fun of anybody. When I preach that, somebody, he, he's preaching right in my family. It's not just your, it's a whole lot of us. I got family, my own family members, not my children, but my nieces and nephews. Shacked up together, having children together, not married, homosexuals. Your family? Yeah, my family. Man, I want God to do something in their hearts. I want God to say, listen, they're going to die and go to hell if God don't do something quick. And that's, that's not just revival for me, but as I said in my Sunday school class this morning, why do you want it? Do we want it for his glory? If we don't, that's what Brother Paul said. Lifting up Jesus, if you don't want to lift him up, you want to get closer to him, you'll have status quo, more of the same, more of the same. Thank you for coming. Um, I just, I'm so, so wanting it, so wanting it, so wanting it. We got to want it together. I love you. God knows my heart. I pray for you. I'm, I want to be there for you. Sometimes late this summer, I've not been where I want to be. I've been in a uh, struggle with my, my health and stuff. But I'm here, and I tell you, the more when, you, when you're not here, you can pray pray more. Thank you. Let's pray. Father, uh, I, I don't know what I'm trying to say. I'm just burdened. I want to see God do something. And, Lord, it, it, before it happened, we, we've got to, as Brother Paul said, we've got to start with repentance, and sometimes we're just satisfied the way we are. Don't mess with me. Don't rock the boat. Lord, how great it could be and will be if we get our hearts and 
our lives right with God for our families, our children, our grandchildren, our nieces, nephews, brothers, sisters, neighbors. Lord, this this is troubled times that we're in. And the only hope, the only answer is Jesus. So bless us to listen to the message that we've heard and the ones that will be presented tonight and tomorrow and Tuesday. And however far, Lord, you'll let it go. I pray, Brother Paul, bless him and help him with strength and health. His family, just take care of them, Lord. Bless our church family. Lots of, of our people are suffering with cancer and treatments. And Lord, I know that a lot of folks are not able to get out at night. They can't see to drive at night, all kinds of things. Maybe we get somebody to try for us. Do what we can to be here to be faithful. Bless us together in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the big choir practice.